and and thank you for coming back and i should thank live cell and sfm for giving me this opportunity to be here again and i must say that i hope you've had something to eat and at least something to drink at least a banana before you start this webinar because this is slightly bigger than what i actually planned initially it's because i wanted to put in a lot of your doubts into this uh, in this uh, webinar i wanted to add all those things that continuously confuse most of you and wanted to give you the answers to most of these problems and that's why this webinar is slightly more longer than what i would normally do and if you remember from last session we talked about does size matter and we clearly understood that size does not matter what matters is whether the fetus has reached its growth potential that is what matters and the most important points i would like to just do a recap again is that you use a standard chart and with the help of the standard chart you divide fetuses into sga fetuses and aga fetuses the ones that are less than the 10th centile according to a standard chart would be called sga and the others would be the so called aga group and you would hunt for fgr fetuses within the sga group as well as the aga group and the tools that you would use to make that diagnosis in the sga group would be doppler as well as the use of an estimated fetal weight less than the 3rd centile and in the aga group you would use a combination of doppler as well as growth velocity so what it means in a nutshell is that whenever you do a growth and growth scan in the third trimester you have to do a growth and doppler scan because when you do a growth and doppler scan that is the only method by which you can pick up fetal growth restriction now the biggest argument against using routine growth and doppler scan is that when you do routine growth and doppler you are going to classify a large number of normal babies as probably abnormal small and when you put a large number of fetuses under surveillance there is a risk that you're running and the risk is unnecessary intervention unnecessary intervention here would be unnecessary early induction of labor or even an unnecessary cesarean section now that happens if you do not listen to the second part and the second part is to listen to the fetus i always believed that the fetus is like a woman and the biggest mistake that a man can make is that to not listen to his woman but to hear what he wants to hear and that's what happens most of the time and even in fgr that's exactly the same thing that happens we do not listen to the fetus but hear what we want to hear and decide whether we want to go in for early delivery termination of pregnancy or whatever and we put the fetus at risk so the question here is do you want to be the man who hears what he wants to hear or listen what your woman is actually telling you i hope you choose the latter now before we go into fgr management there are three concepts that i want you to understand three critical concepts the first concept being the uniqueness of the placenta the second one being the difference between cardiovascular adaptation and brain stem suppression and the third concept being hypoxic threshold versus lung maturity now the placenta is a unique organ because it is it functions in two methods it is a nutritional organ as well as a respiratory organ it functions as a nutritional organ because it supplies nutrients to the baby and the baby grows well and when we want to make a diagnosis of fgr we are assessing the nutritional capacity of the placenta so by looking at the nutritional capacity is the baby going well as we have discussed before using growth charts we try to find out if the baby is growth restricting or not but when we come to management we are looking at the respiratory capacity of the placenta is the baby hypoxic is the baby acidotic is oxygen exchange taking place properly across the placenta and therefore our management decisions are driven by the placental capacity as a respiratory organ so that is the principal difference the placenta as a nutritional organ and as a respiratory organ when it comes to management now coming to cardiovascular adaptation Now the heart behaves differently in a fetus in different gestations in early onset growth restriction when there is severe placental disease there is severe hypoxia 
the umbilical artery is always going to be abnormal. So therefore, this heart has to work against increased resistance in the umbilical artery in a setting of hypoxia. And therefore, what happens? The heart fails and the sign of heart failure would be a DV abnormality. Not being shared? Okay, so what do I do? Yeah. We will go to PDF. No, 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 doctor. Click on slide. Oh, your entire screen. One second. It's it's now coming. Is it coming now? Yes, it's loading. It's loading. Should I start from the beginning or? Yeah, you can. You can from the two sides back. Oh. From now. From this part, or should I start from the beginning? Okay. Okay, I'll start from the beginning. I'll start from here then. Okay. Okay. Am I live? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I guess it's Murphy's law. If everything went well in the first webinar, something has to go wrong in this webinar. I'm totally sorry about that. And I do not know if, uh, if uh, from where you missed me. But I'll start from the beginning. It's basically about uh, listening to the fetus. And as I told you, you have to understand and hear what the fetus is saying. Listen to the fetus rather than hear what you want to hear. And then I was going through the management key concepts where you look at the uniqueness of the placenta, cardiovascular adaptation versus brain stem suppression, and finally, hypoxic threshold versus lung maturity. When we look at the placenta, we look at it as a nutritional as well as a respiratory organ. And when we look at it as a nutritional organ, we're trying to make the diagnosis of FGR. So you're using or assessing the nutritional capacity of the placenta to make the diagnosis of FGR. And when we are using the placenta as a respiratory organ, that is when we decide whether we want to go in for delivery or not. Is the baby hypoxic? Is the baby acidotic or not? And that is how we make the decision to deliver. The second concept is cardiovascular adaptation. Now, the heart behaves differently in different gestations. In early onset fetal growth restriction, when you have severe placental disease, you're also going to get severe hypoxia. Now, because of that, you're going to have resistance within the umbilical artery. Now, this heart has to pump blood through a resistant umbilical artery in a setting of hypoxia. And because of that, the heart begins to fail and you would get a DV abnormality. Now that is unique to early onset fetal growth restriction. Now when we look at late onset fetal growth restriction, you have mild placental disease, mild hypoxia. Therefore the umbilical artery is going to be normal and therefore the heart has to work less. It does not have to struggle to push blood through the umbilical artery and there is not much hypoxia and therefore the DV is always going to be normal. So this is a critical difference. Cardiovascular adaptation and abnormalities in the ductus venosus is going to be present in late early onset growth restriction, but is going to be completely absent in late onset fetal growth restriction. And the tools that we have to assess the heart is Doppler. We look at the preload of the heart. So when the heart is failing, there is increased pressure behind the heart. And as a result of that, you're going to get increased pressure within the precordial vessels. And which are the precordial vessels that we can look at? There is the IVC, there is the SVC, there is the ductus venosus. Of all these vessels, the best vessel would be the ductus venosus. The computerized CTG also assesses the heart and allows you to know whether the heart is failing or not. But I'm not going to deal with that because we don't use it. And probably it is not very routinely practiced all over India. So what you're going to look at is basically the ductus venosus as the primary tool to assess cardiovascular adaptation. Now coming to the brainstem. Now in the brainstem, the importance here is the difference in susceptibility across gestational ages. Now the brainstem is immature in earlier gestations and therefore has lower oxygen requirement and therefore it is resistant to hypoxia. But the same brainstem at 32 or 34 weeks is highly sensitive to hypoxia and therefore is very susceptible to hypoxia, can get suppressed, which in turn can cause the heart to stop. So the basic understanding is that 
in early onset growth restriction the heart is more susceptible to hypoxia and increased afterload while the brain is sort of resistant and therefore our entire management would be revolving around the capacity of the heart to withstand that hypoxia and that's why in early onset fetal growth restriction we are going to look at doppler abnormalities primarily to decide whether we want to go in for early delivery or not in late onset growth restriction the heart is happy it's healthy because it is doing well there is very little resistance in the umbilical artery there is mild hypoxia but the brain is highly susceptible to hypoxia at this point of time and therefore our major concern is going to be the brain and therefore our entire management protocol is going to be revolving around not doppler but the integrity of the brain stem and so when you look at the brain stem the tools that you can use are the biophysical profile the computerized ctg and something that every obstetrician knows daily fetal movement count done by the mother i'll explain all this in detail the next third important concept is the difference between hypoxia and lung maturity so what are we trying to do basically we are trying to prevent intrauterine death that's where we are monitoring this fetus but at the same time we are worried if we take the baby out too early the baby's lungs will not be mature enough and probably there would be ex utero death so we have to balance these two things and at the same time we have to be sure that the long term neurological outcomes are also not bad so here i want you to remember this number 32 weeks the gestational age of 32 weeks is what is universally accepted as the timeline beyond which we are not worried about lung maturity that much so what that means is if the baby is less than 32 weeks we are more worried about the baby dying outside the uterus and therefore we wait for a severe abnormality and that severe abnormality is acidosis so less than 32 weeks we wait for acidosis to for delivery and after 32 weeks when we are no longer worried about lung maturity we are going to be looking at hypoxia So if there is severe hypoxia we would deliver after 32 weeks if there is acidosis we would deliver before 32 weeks and here is the importance of probably aortic isthmus which has not been proved as yet and i will explain all this in detail so the players that we are looking at in the management of growth restriction are doppler biophysical profile amniotic fluid and your daily daily fetal movement count let's start off with doppler in doppler as i told you there are two diagnostic two abnormalities of doppler that you should know the diagnostic doppler abnormalities and the prognosticating doppler abnormalities the diagnostic markers are used to make the diagnosis of fgi which we have already covered in the uh, in the class last week and today we are going to solely confine ourselves to prognosticating markers now these are abnormalities which would force you to think of delivering the baby before 37 weeks so any doppler abnormality that forces you to take the baby out before 37 weeks is a prognosticating marker so for that you have the umbilical artery the ductus venosus and the aortic isthmus let's start off with the umbilical artery now the in the umbilical artery we are looking at specific abnormalities that could trigger preterm delivery and that is an absent end diastolic flow and a reverse end diastolic flow and both of them are gestational age dependent let me explain how but before that you should understand some very important tips while looking at the umbilical artery the first thing i want you to remember that when you are trying to differentiate between absent end diastolic flow and a reversed end diastolic flow maternal breathing is probably your biggest enemy and your second enemy is going to be proper doppler settings now let me give you this example here here on the left side of your screen you can see it is absent end diastolic flow and on the right side you can see that the umbilical artery is blinking and so for all practical purposes you would call this as an absent end diastolic flow But let's look at this a bit more closely when you look at it what do you see can you see that the abdomen is moving and as the mother is breathing the spectrum is going in and out of the umbilical artery creating that visual artifact of an absent end diastolic flow and when you ask the mother to stop breathing as i have done in this clip immediately you can find that the spectrum is sitting within the umbilical artery and when you take that trace it becomes clear that there is diastolic flow present 
And it's very important to actually sample the umbilical cord in different areas before saying that it is absent end diastolic flow. Again, a common error that most of us make is that we call it intermittent absent end diastolic flow when you find that certain loops of the cord is showing absent end diastolic flow while the rest of the cord is showing diastolic flow. There is no such terminology in singleton pregnancies. Intermittent absent end diastolic flow is solely used in selective IUGR in monochorionic pregnancies and not in singleton pregnancies. When you find that there is a difference in resistance in different parts of the umbilical cord, yes, you can make a note of it, but you would record the least resistance to decide your management. And the second point is the importance of gain. When adjusting your color settings, I mean, you're looking at a vessel, it is important that you adjust the gain and not the PRF when you're trying to differentiate between absent end diastolic flow and reversed end diastolic flow. Can you see here in this picture, in this moving clip, I can see there is a lot of bleeding. And when you see a lot of bleeding and color going all around the place, our natural tendency is to increase the PRF. But if you increase the PRF, you will completely miss out on small flow that is present in reversed end diastolic flow. So what you need to do is you have to drop your gain. And when you drop your gain, can you see clearly, you can see here very well that there is red and blue alternating with each other. And when you take a trace, you can see that there is a reversed end diastolic flow. And look at the velocity, the peak systolic velocity of the reversed end diastolic flow. It is extremely small. And that is why when you increase your PRF or if you increase your wall motion filter, that flow can completely disappear and you may call it as an absent end diastolic flow. Now, why is it so important to differentiate between absent and reversed? Yes, there is more placental damage when there is a reversed end diastolic flow, but the critical difference here is that in absent end diastolic flow, you're talking about severe hypoxia. And in reversed end diastolic flow, you're talking about probable acidosis. And if there is acidosis, you have to deliver before 32 weeks. Remember the magic number. And if there is only hypoxia, you can wait till after 32 weeks. And that is why it's very important to make this distinction between an absent and reversed end diastolic flow. Now, there is another utility of the umbilical artery, and that comes in counseling. For example, if you see that there is a severe abnormality or if there is an increased resistance in the umbilical artery along with growth restriction and you find that it starts before 26 weeks, then most of the times this baby will develop a severe Doppler abnormality that will require delivery by 30 weeks. That is called a severe placental disease. But if you have FGR with umbilical artery resistance that starts after 26 weeks, but before 29 weeks, then there is a good chance that this baby will go up to 33 weeks. But if it starts at 31 weeks or after, then it is called as mild placental disease. And there is a good chance that this baby will go up to 35 weeks. So this is very essential in counseling because when you have severe growth restriction that starts very early, these are the numbers that are going to help you in counseling the parents and telling them, this is what we can look forward to. Now, coming to the ductus venosus. Now, the ductus venosus is my favorite vessel because of a number of reasons. And the first reason is that it enters into the heart and it follows certain basic principles. The ductus venosus initially has high resistance, but as the gestation progresses, its resistance drops and there is increased forward flow. This happens because of two reasons. One, the placental resistance drops. And secondly, the ventricles become more compliant. And this is how you will see the ductus. Now, everyone, when they look at the ductus venosus flow, they will immediately tell you that the ductus venosus flow is going into the venous vestibule. And from there, it is ending in the right atrium. And that is where we make our first mistake. Because if you look at the flow of the ductus venosus, it is entering into the right atrium, yes, but it does not supply the right atrium. It falls through the foramen ovale into the left atrium and supplies purely oxygenated blood to the heart and to the brain through the left ventricle. Now, this is because the foramen ovale acts as a trap door. It's as if you're entering into a room where there is a trap door. And as soon as you enter into that room, the trap door opens and the blood drops down into the left atrium. And that left atrium gets purely oxygenated blood. And that's how you can see here in this clip clearly the red bar going up, which is the 
flow from the IVC and the blue color bar going down and flopping downwards into the, the, into the left atrium. And this is the waveform that you will get in the ductus venosus, which is called as a triphasic waveform. Now, this triphasic waveform has three parts. The S wave corresponds to ventricular systole, and the D and A wave corresponds to diastole. And in the D and A wave, there are two parts. The first part being early diastole, which corresponds to the early passive filling from the atria to the ventricle. And the second part being the small A wave, or the large A wave across the AV wall, which is the atrial kick or the atrial contraction. Now, when the atria contracts, the pressure within the DV rises and the forward flow dips, and that is what we use in the management of FGR. Now, to understand this, this principle of the ductus venosus, you should understand that the fetal circulation happens in parallel. The right ventricular cardiac output and the left ventricular cardiac output are completely separate. The right ventricular cardiac output supplies the subdiaphragmatic and the placental vessels, whereas the left ventricular output goes to the head and neck, that is the brachiocephalic vessels. So in growth resistance, what is, what is happening? The placental resistance increases, Therefore, the afterload of the right heart increases, the cerebral resistance drops, therefore the afterload of the left heart decreases. So which heart, part of the heart is going to fail first? The right heart is going to fail first, followed by the left heart. And this is why I call the ductus venosus as the tragic romantic hero, because the ductus throughout its entire small lifespan supplies the left atrium and makes sure that the left atrium gets purely oxygenated blood that supports the heart and the brain, but it eventually bears the brunt of RV and RA failure, and that's why it reverses, and at delivery, it perishes an unseen death. That's why the ductus venosus is also my favorite vessel. And when you look at the ductus venosus, there are two abnormalities that you should know about. One is high PA or high resistance, and the other one being DV reversal. Now, the truffle trial has clearly shown that we don't need to look at the DV high PI values. We just need to look for a DV absent A wave or DV reversal, where there is a high suspicion of acidosis. And in those conditions, there is a need to deliver these babies before 32 weeks. And this does not happen late onset growth restriction, because as I told you, the heart is happy and will not fail in late onset growth restriction. Now, coming to the aortic isthmus. Now, there has been a lot of talk about the aortic isthmus on whether it is good enough, should we be using it. And I'm going to solve that problem completely today by looking at certain important principles of the aortic isthmus. The aortic isthmus is a junction of the aorta and the ductus arteriosus, and it is located distal to the left subclavian artery. And this is how it would look like when you measure it in the 3VT view, and this is how it would look like on the sagittal section. It doesn't matter which view you use, but the best and the easiest view would be the 3VT view. Now, what happens in the, uh, in the aortic isthmus is that you have a junction here between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. Purely oxygenated blood will be coming through the left ventricle, and as it enters through into, into the uh, aorta, it supplies the head and neck vessels but the right ventricle goes downwards through the descending aorta. Now, during systole, the left ventricle tries to push blood through the aortic isthmus, whereas during systole, the right ventricle tries to push blood in the opposite direction. This is what I want all of you to understand. At this junction, there are two opposing forces in systole. The left ventricle trying to push it forward and the, uh, the right ventricle trying to push it in the opposite direction. But during diastole, once the semilunar valve is closed, then the forward flow is dependent on the resistance difference between the placenta and the head and neck vessels. So when there is increased resistance in the placenta, blood will go in the reverse direction. But when there is low resistance in the placenta, blood will go in the anti-grade direction during diastole. Now that's exactly what you see in this waveform of the aortic isthmus. You can see a sharp upward stroke here. That is because the left ventricle is trying to push blood through the aortic isthmus. And then immediately after that, you will find a sharp dip. The sharp dip is because the right ventricle is trying to push blood in the opposite direction. And the right ventricle is the dominant ventricle here and pushes the blood so much that you can get a small systolic reversal here, which is normal and is slightly more 
saturated in the third trimester. And finally, in diastole, you have forward flow because there is decreased resistance within the placenta. So this is how an aortic isthmus reversal will look like. Now, at the aortic isthmus, I want you to understand this. There are four opposing forces. The left ventricle insistently trying to push the blood forward. The right ventricle trying to push the blood in the backward direction insistently. In diastole, there is a peripheral resistance that is trying to push the blood backwards. And there is a middle cerebral artery resistance which is trying to push the blood forwards. So what happens is that this is a watershed area of four variables. Two variables for each of these cardiac cycles. And why is it important to understand this is that because when we are assessing the aortic isthmus, we are only looking at two types of abnormalities. The first abnormality is a retrograde flow with net forward flow, which means there is a retrograde flow in the aortic isthmus, but the net flow is going to be forward. And this is normally seen in redistribution, and we are not worried about this. But if you have retrograde flow with net reversal, that means the blood that is going back is more than the blood that is going forward. It means that the brain is fine, the heart baby is finding it very difficult to maintain oxygenation of the brain. And that is what led to this theory that why can't we use the aortic isthmus? Why can't we look at the aortic isthmus and try to predict neurological outcomes? And that's why a number of papers came out trying to look at this particular point. And these papers by the Greta Causes Group and the systematic review, which came out in 2017, looked at this particular problem and what they found was that yes net reversal is possible and could cause abnormalities but net reversal occurred only after a severe umbilical artery abnormality it means only after you had an absent or reversed end diastolic flow in the umbilical artery would there be a net reversal in the aortic isthmus and yes it becomes abnormal before the ductus venosus most of the times but it was not sensitive enough which means if you find that the aortic isthmus flow is normal, it may be reassuring. But if it is a reversing, you are not sure whether it is a predictor for cerebral damage. And that is why we cannot use it. Because when we see an abnormality in the aortic isthmus flow, we are not sure which of these four players are causing this abnormality. Is this because of a left ventricular problem or a right ventricular problem? a middle cerebral artery problem or due to a placental resistance problem. Because when there are four players in the same area, it is impossible to find who is at fault. And that is principally the reason why aortic isthmus fails. And right now, we can only use it under research and probably in the future, it can be used. Now coming to the middle cerebral artery and the CPR, a lot has been talked about the CPR and the MCA. And the question is, can we use it in growth restriction? Is it possible to use these values in growth restriction? Now we know that in growth restriction, you're going to get the brain sparing effect and the middle cerebral artery will dilate and will show decreased resistance. And the CPR is useful when you have mild abnormalities in the middle cerebral artery and mild ab abnormalities in the umbilical artery, but they're still within their normal range. So the CPR is a sensitive marker for hypoxia, while the MCA is a very specific marker for hypoxia. But the question here is, can we use it in fetal growth restriction? Let us look at early onset growth restriction. In early onset growth restriction, the placental disease is severe, there is severe hypoxia, therefore definitely the MCA is going to be compensated. And therefore there is no clinical utility in looking at the MCA Doppler and deciding on the mode of delivery. In early onset of FGR, it is the ductus venosus that will decide whether you want to go in for early delivery or not. And the MCA is not going to give you any added advantage because the MCA is always going to be bad. This is an example where you can see that the MCA is completely dilated, early gestation, it does not tell you anything else about the integrity of the baby. And also you have to remember that this brain, this early onset growth restricted brain is highly resistant to hypoxia and therefore the effects of cerebral sparing or vasodilatation is not that significant. So on early onset growth restriction, we do not use MCA in surveillance or management. What about late onset FGR? Yes, in late onset FGR, MCA predicts adverse outcomes. When the MCA is abnormal, there is a good chance of poor neurological outcome later on. And it has been shown that there is poor perinatal outcomes as well. But can it be used in surveillance? Now, the biggest problem of the MCA is that it becomes abnormal very, very late. 
That is the biggest problem here. If you look at this chart, again, a study done by Keratokos's group, you can see here that the middle cervical artery becomes grossly abnormal only after 36 weeks. And if you look at the slope of the middle cervical artery, what do you see? It's not very steep. It is almost steady from 32 to 36 weeks. And therefore, its utility as a surveillance tool is not that great. But look at the CPR. The CPR becomes frankly abnormal right from 31 weeks onwards. And look at the slope. The slope is extremely steep and that tells you that this is something that can be used for surveillance and therefore in cerebral dopplers it is the cpr that can be used and not mca and it can be used only for late onset growth restriction in early onset growth restriction mca and cpr, CPR do not have any value Coming to the biophysical profile, whenever I talk about biophysical profile, I always feel as if I'm talking about Dhoni because we needed Dhoni to win the World Cup, but right now everyone's debating do we need him or not. But the fact is that it doesn't matter how many Virat Kohli's you have in your team, a Dhoni is always, always useful because towards the end of your game, there can't be a better finisher than Dhoni. And let me tell you how. Because in the brainstem, what are we assessing? We are assessing these primary centers. CTG, which looks at cardiac variability, breathing movement, fetal tone, and fetal movement. Now, the biggest problem when I talk about brainstem or the biophysical profile is that everyone argues it would take 30 minutes to do a whole biophysical profile. Where do I have the time to do a whole biophysical profile? Now, here's the news for all of you. The average time in a study that was done to actually see how much time it actually takes, the average time to do a good biophysical profile of a baby is only 5.3 minutes. But I'm not asking you to do the complete biophysical profile. I'm only asking you to look at the breathing movement. That's all. Now, the reason why I'm asking you to do that is because the susceptibility of these centers to hypoxia is different. The breathing center, the center that controls breathing movement, and also the center that controls cardiac variability is the most sensitive to hypoxia. So when you have hypoxia, the first thing to go would be the breathing movement followed by loss of variability in the CTG. So how difficult it is when you're doing your scan to look for the breathing movement, because you're already doing your growth, already doing your Doppler, how difficult it is to just look at the diaphragm and see for that paradoxical movement, or even if you find that to be difficult, just switch on color Doppler and look at the nose and you would see a good healthy baby would be breathing normally. The CTG again is the next thing that you should remember because if you have brainstem suppression, the CTG is also going to show an abnormality. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole uh, CTG and how it has to be done, but I will just tell you a couple of points. When you find that the heart rate is variable, that is good heart rate variability with accelerations, it means that the baby is smiling, the baby is happy, there is no hypoxia. But when you see there is decreased variability, it means that there is probably hypoxia. And when you see that there is late decelerations, it means that the baby is acidotic. Now here again, decreased variability on a regular CTG might be difficult for us to interpret because there is a lot of inter and intra observer variation and the computerized CTG does one better and makes it more objective. But because we do not have computerized CTG, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm only going to talk about how you can use your regular CTG in your management of growth restriction. Now the regular CTG will show a decreased variability if there is severe hypoxia and will show late deceleration if there is acidosis. Now when you're looking at preterm FGR or early onset growth restriction, you're going to look at severe placental disease, umbilical artery is abnormal, the heart becomes abnormal much before the CTG becomes abnormal. Why? Because the brain stem is resistant to hypoxia. This is the reason why in early onset growth restriction, the Doppler becomes abnormal before the CTG or before the biophysical profile. And therefore, it need not be used as frequently as you would in late onset growth restriction. In late onset growth restriction, the brain stem is sensitive to hypoxia. Umbilical artery is going to be normal. The DV is always going to be normal. The heart is healthy and happy, but the brain, as it feels the fall in oxygen, it is going to throw up an abnormality on your CTG much before anything else goes abnormal. And that is why, as I said before, don't need the late finisher, biophysical profile in late onset term FGR fetuses. 
they are indispensable. You can't have a better method to look at the brainstem than look at the CTG and look at the breathing movement on your scan. So the difference is earlier gestation, probably not that useful because you would have cardiac decompensation before you have brainstem suppression, but towards term, you would have brainstem suppression first before you have a cardiovascular or a Doppler problem. And finally, the last player would be the daily fetal movement. As an obstetrician, I'm sure all obstetricians would know the importance of daily fetal movement count. But it was this paper which came out in 2018, which actually opened up our eyes and told us that by looking at daily fetal movement, especially in the SGA fetuses, is going to be very, very helpful. And 55% of women experience it before stillbirth, and majority of them have an episode of a decreased fetal movement three to four days before that happens. Now, the problem with daily fetal movement count is that there is no specific pattern that we can say like 10 counts per day or 15 counts per day. There is no specific pattern. The Each, each fetus has its own pattern of movement and the best judge would be the mother. And most likely the mother would come to the clinic and say, something's not right. I don't feel that good. The baby is not moving so well. And if she comes to you and says that at two episodes, then that is something you should watch out for. And if that is a case of late onset growth restriction or a baby that is FGR and that is less than the 50, 50th centile, that is something you should be careful about. Maybe not so much in early onset growth restriction, but in late onset growth restriction or term FGR, listen to the mother. What about the amniotic fluid? The problem with the amniotic fluid is that it tells us nothing about the condition of the fetus. Yes, there is poor perfusion. Poor perfusion will lead to decreased urinary output and lead to less amount of amniotic fluid. But that does not tell you whether the baby is hypoxic or whether the baby is acidotic. And that is the problem with the amniotic fluid. And if you look at the study, it shows that the amniotic fluid, once it went into oligohydramnios, remained the same for eight weeks, which means for a period of eight weeks, there was no change in the amniotic fluid. And that is not good enough for us to actually decide whether we want to go in for delivery or not. We need to look at the brainstem or we need to look at Doppler to decide on, do on the early delivery, but not on the amniotic fluid. Now, it is not possible for me to talk about any of these things unless i touch upon this trial the truffle trial which i believe is good but at the same time it has done a little bit of uh, uh, problems with the uh, with the management of early onset growth restriction let me explain why now this paper is extremely useful because this looks at the outcomes of early onset growth restriction and it is done by the people who are doing the truffle trial and therefore they have analyzed the entire truffle trial and given a very good uh, exp explanation on what you should do if you have a patient with early onset growth restriction. Now to tell you briefly about this trial, what they did in this trial is that they looked at babies with growth restriction, early onset growth restriction before 32 weeks and tried to find out the best trigger for delivery. So they divided these uh, mothers into three groups and decided a trigger for each of these three groups. In one group, it was when the DVPI was high, greater than the 95th centile. In another one, they used the computerized CTG and when the short term variability was low, they decided to deliver in that group. And the third group, they decided to deliver if the DV was showing an absent A wave or if there was reversal. And the results were that it was good to wait for DV reversal. There was better outcomes, not only neonatal, but also long-term outcomes. And they also conclusively showed that cerebral Doppler was not useful. But when this result came out, what people started doing was that they just started managing early onset growth restriction by looking at the DV. Just keep on doing your scans and wait for the DV to reverse. That is not what this trial said, because we had to read the fine print of this trial. And the fine print of this trial is the safety net. The safety net was used in this trial to prevent fetal demise. And the safety net was used in all these three groups. And the safety net was a CTG, late decelerations on the CTG, or a severe abnormality on the umbilical artery. If there was a reversed end diastolic flow from 30 weeks onwards, they were delivering in this trial. If there was absent end diastolic flow after 32 weeks also, they were delivering. So by using the safety net, only they were able to get the outcomes that they were talking about. And here is the clincher. 
one third of the babies in the truffle trial came out with the safety net and one third of them they delivered due to maternal indications, which means a sizable amount, two third of these babies delivered outside the protocol. And the DV reversal protocol, the group, the DV reversal group, which is supposed to have the best outcome, 50% of them delivered because of the safety net. And here's the best part. Almost all these women had a daily CTG. So the truffle trial does not say that you can simply wait for the DV to reverse. It tells you, yes, wait for the DV to reverse, but don't forget to use the safety net. Don't keep on looking at the DV after 30 weeks. If there is a severe umbilical artery abnormality like a reversal, you can deliver. Do a CTG almost daily in this group because if you find reversal, or if you find late decelerations on the CTG, don't keep on waiting for DV reversal. You have to deliver the baby. And that is what is the importance of the truffle trial. It tells you, yes, DV reversal, but you have to also remember to look at the safety net. So now let us look at our players and their specific teams. There are two teams here, the early onset fetal growth restriction team, and the players here are Doppler, the ductus venosus, and the umbilical artery, which would decide when you want to deliver them, and also the CTG will act as the safety net. So this is the group that deals with cardiovascular adaptation and not the brainstem. In late onset growth restriction team, you have Doppler, which looks at CPR, you have CTG, breathing movement and daily fetal movement count by the mother. Here we are solely concentrating on the brain stem and not on the heart because we know that the heart is not going to give us any important clue in the late onset fetal growth restriction group. So now let's, now let's go into the early onset fetal growth restriction and see how we manage these cases. Now in early onset growth restriction, the diagnosis is easy because you have a small baby with Doppler abnormalities, but the difficult part is on how to manage these patients. How do we deliver them? And for delivering them, we use Doppler and use the CTG as a safety net. Now to understand how we deliver in early onset growth restriction, you should understand the sequence of events that are happening. So the first event would be a placental damage that is greater than 30%, which will lead to an umbilical artery abnormality. And now the heart has to work against increased resistance in the umbilical artery in a setting of hypoxia. And as it continues to work, the heart fails. And finally, you will have a CTG abnormality, which will finally lead to death. So here the CTG abnormality happens after your Doppler abnormality. But as you can see, that there is a sequence of abnormalities happening here. So when you have a sequential occurrence of abnormalities, you can classify them into stages. And that is exactly what Greta Kors did in his paper, where he divided early onset growth restriction into groups based on the abnormalities that were present. So he divided them into four groups based on the abnormalities that were seen. So the first group had positive flow within the umbilical artery during diastole also may have an abnormality within the uterine artery and this is the group that had hypoxia but not severe hypoxia. The second group had absent end diastolic flow in the umbilical artery and this is the one that had severe hypoxia. So in these two groups one and two you do not have acidosis you only have hypoxia. First one having mild hypoxia and the stage two having severe hypoxia. In stage three, you have a DV pulsatility index that is greater than the 95th centile, or you have a reversal in the umbilical artery. And in stage four, you have frank reversal in the DV or the ductus venosus. So stage three and four is dealing with different grades of acidosis. So one and two is dealing with hypoxia, three and four is dealing with acidosis. And if you remember what I told you, hypoxia versus lung maturity, 32 is your magic number. So immediately you can say without doing anything else that you would want to deliver stage three and four before 32 weeks and you will want to deliver stage one and two after 32 weeks because stage one and two is dealing with hypoxia whereas stage three and four is dealing with acidosis. Now this is the same principle that was used and once they divided them into four stages, they also decided on how you could do your follow-up and also when you would want to decide your mode of delivery. So in stage one where you have mild hypoxia, you could take these babies up to term and deliver them between 34 and 37 weeks and you would call them for a weekly once surveillance. 
In stage two, where you have slightly more severe hypoxia, you can wait up to 32 to 34 weeks. And here you will follow them up on a twice weekly basis. Once that you follow them up twice in a week. Now, as you progress into acidosis, your gestational age is going to fall below 32 weeks. So in stage three, when you have acidosis, you can divide them into two groups, 28 and 30 and 30 and 32. Below 30 weeks, you will wait for TV reversal. And between 30 and 32 weeks, you will deliver if there is a reversed end diastolic flow in the umbilical artery. When you come to stage four, when there is frank acidosis and the DV is reversing, you are not going to wait. You have to deliver. You probably do surveillance on an hourly or a daily basis. And here the gestational age is very important. If the gestational age is less than 26 weeks, then the PV might not be viable and here you have to talk to the parents and decide whether they want to deliver or not but otherwise once they cross into the period of viability there is no question of waiting when the DV is reversing you give steroids and you deliver now let us look at a case example now these are two different case examples 29 weeks gestation both of them were diagnosed as having FGR one was told to terminate its pregnancy because there was no hope to salvage the fetus it seems and the other was told to do an emergency cesarean section now, I will show you with this example how using a stage helps you because it allows you to make a decision that is a bit more focused rather than relying on, on just what you feel and going by your gut feeling and also to decide what you want to do based on actual staging protocols. So these are the charts of these babies, Mrs. X and Mrs. Y. Both of them are severely growth restricted. I don't think you need a chart to tell you that both of these babies are very, very small. And both of them had the same abnormality in the umbilical artery. That is an absent end diastolic flow. So because you saw an absent end diastolic flow, you have to see whether the heart is holding up or not. And therefore, what do you look at? You look at the ductus venosus. Now, I want you to pay close attention to the MCA dopplers in both Mrs. X and Mrs. Y. Can you see that both of them are compensated? Does that provide you with any information? No information at all. And therefore, that is what I want to stress again. By looking at the middle cerebral artery, there is nothing that you can gain in early onset growth restriction. And therefore, you have to look at the other vessel, that is the DV, and look at how different the DVs are in these two babies. Mrs. Y is having a DV that is greater than the 95th centile, and Mrs. X is having a DV that is around the 50th centile. So this immediately tells you that Mrs. X is in stage 2, there is no acidosis as yet. Mrs. Y is having a low suspicion of acidosis at 29 weeks. So remember the magic number, 32 weeks. So no acidosis, you can wait till 32. Acidosis or a probable suspicion of acidosis, you may have to deliver this baby early. And so that is what exactly the protocol says. And that is what we did in this case. This is why we did a repeat ultrasound after 12 weeks to confirm our findings. We found that the DV was reversing. We delivered her after giving steroids. Now in Mrs. X, what do we do? Absent and diastolic flow. The protocol tells us to do a twice weekly surveillance. And here is where you should not make the mistake of using or following the truffle trial blindly without reading the fine print. Because if you decide just to look at Doppler and nothing else, there's a good chance that this baby will die. Instead of that, what you should do? You should do daily CTGs. Yes, you should do your Doppler surveillance twice in a week. You should also monitor the mother because what did the truffle trial tell you? One third of those babies delivered because of maternal hypertension. And that is why the mother has to be monitored as well. And you will give steroids only when you think delivery is imminent. Now, why am I saying give steroids only when delivery is imminent is because when you give steroids, there are going to be changes in the Doppler as well as the CTG. In the Doppler, there could be a reappearance of the diastolic flow. And in the CTG, there could be reduced variability. And sometimes even the breathing movement and also fetal movement can be affected by giving steroids. So that can create a lot of confusion in your management. And the culprit here is bitamethasone and probably dexamethasone would be better if you're giving in cases of FGR because it has an advantage of not creating these problems. But again, these are debatable changes, but that has to be kept in mind while you're looking at fetal growth restriction and when you're giving steroids. Now coming to late onset fetal growth restriction. Now late onset fetal growth restriction, here the problem is in diagnosis. It is easy to manage late onset growth restriction. I'll tell you why it is easy, but it is difficult to diagnose. It is easy, one, because uh, you're not worried about lung maturity anymore, but there is one more reason 
why it is easy to manage late onset growth restriction. Now, the diagnosis is difficult because most of these babies are going to fall less than the 10th center only at 36 weeks. That is the problem here because in late onset growth restriction, the abnormalities in growth or Doppler may be evident only at 36 weeks. It was shown in this trial by uh, Gratacos's group. And if you do a scan at 36 weeks, that is when you will probably be able to pick up late onset growth restriction. So in the third trimester, it is not enough to do just one scan at 32 weeks or 33 weeks. I would suggest that you do two scans, one at 32 and 33 weeks, and another at 36 or 37 weeks. And both of them should have Doppler because unless you do that, you will not be able to pick up fetal growth restriction in the SGA group and also in the AGA group. Let me show you this with this example. 19 weeks fetus was growing beautifully. At, it's on the green line. We called her back 33 weeks still on the same line. There is no drop. It's going across on that green line. The estimated fetal weight is at the 39 centile. Now, if you decide not to do a scan 36 weeks and tell this baby to come back, tell this mother to come back at maybe 38 weeks or 39 weeks, or maybe to come back with spontaneous onset of labor, there is a good chance that this baby would have died. Why? Because when we did a scan at 37 weeks, we found that the estimated fetal weight dropped to the fifth centile. And this is something that you could have missed completely even on your clinical examination. And that is why the diagnosis of late onset growth restriction is difficult if you do not perform at least two scans in the third trimester. And both of them should have Doppler in it if you want to pick up that growth of fetal, rest fetal growth restriction. So what happens in uh, late onset IUGR is that you have an uh, uterine artery, which may or may not be abnormal, but you have a placental disease that is less than 30%. Now, because the placental disease is less than 30%, the umbilical artery is going to be normal. And because the umbilical artery is normal, the heart is going to be happy and healthy, but the brain stem is susceptible. And therefore, what is going to happen is that you're going to have an abnormality in your CTG or your biophysical profile before you have Doppler changes. But the biggest clincher here is that all these things can happen after 34 weeks. And that is why I said the management in late onset growth restriction is easy because all your problems in late onset growth restriction, all your abnormalities of the biophysical profile, the CTG, the risk of fetal death happens after 34 weeks. And therefore, if you just deliver the baby at 38 weeks, you're reducing your risk of stillbirth by 50% without doing anything. So when you make the diagnosis of fetal growth restriction, late onset fetal growth restriction, or a fetal growth restriction in an AGA fetus, you are immediately saving the life of that baby by just deciding to deliver at 38 weeks. But that does not mean that in the intervening period, that is between 32 to 38, there are problems. There are definitely problems and you should put that baby under surveillance. And what are the points that you're going to look at and how are you going to decide whether you want to trigger preterm delivery in the late onset group? For that, we have the tools CPR, CTG, breathing movement and daily fetal movement count. And here I want you to want to stress again that when you have late onset growth restriction, you will use your CTG, you'll use your CPR, and you will use them on a weekly one basis. But you should increase your surveillance, increase the number of times you assess the fetus if you find that the CPR is falling or the MCA is less than the fifth centile. And also if you feel that the mother is complaining of decreased fetal movements. So under those circumstances, you will increase your surveillance from your weekly one basis. And if you find that the CPR is falling or the MC is abnormal, you do not decide to go in and do early delivery. That's not what you do. You increase the surveillance. Let me give you examples. This is a case that came to us 31 weeks and this baby was showing clearly growth restriction, late onset growth restriction. The umbilical artery was normal, middle cervical artery was normal, the CPR is also absolutely normal. We followed up this patient and look what's happening to the middle cervical artery and the umbilical artery. Remember what I told you, follow the trend of the vessels. And if you follow the trend, you can see that the umbilical artery is going up, the middle cervical artery is going down, and at around 32 weeks, 
what do you see? 32 to 33 weeks, what do you see? You see that the CPR has become less than the fifth centile. It's at 1.1, less than the second centile. Now, when you see that the CPR is low and falling, what do you do? You go in and immediately deliver a 33-week-old baby or a 34-week-old baby? No. You do. You increase your surveillance. You do more CTG. So that's what we did. And this is what we did. We did a CTG. And look at the CTG. You have variability, you have acceleration. So what is the baby doing? The baby is smiling. There is no severe hypoxia. We followed up this fetus again, continue to follow it up. And now at around 35 weeks, what do you see? You can see that the umbilical artery has increased. The middle cerebral artery has dropped. The CPR is at 0 0.9, less than the first centile. And again, we did a CTG and we found now there was no fetal heart variability. And when we repeated it, we found that there was deceleration. When we found late decelerations, we decided to go in for early delivery. So the important message here is that the brainstem is highly susceptible to hypoxia and the Doppler cannot actually assess that, cannot actually tell you whether the brainstem is suppressed. So the CPR does not give you that information, but the CPR does tell you that there is dropping hypoxia. Please look at the brainstem a bit more carefully and increase your surveillance. That's what it tells you. And that's exactly what uh, daily fetal moment count tells you. It tells you that there is increasing hypoxia. You're not able to pick it up on your Doppler. Please increase your surveillance. What about the AGA fetus that we've been always talking about because size does not matter. The AGA fetus is going to be managed exactly as you would manage your late onset fetal restriction group with weekly one surveillance with CPR and CTG and you would deliver them by 38 weeks. And if you find that the CPR is dropping, you would increase your surveillance. And that's exactly what was shown in this paper. This paper I had alluded to in my last talk as well on how it is important to look at the CPR to predict outcomes. And what they proposed was that if you find that the baby is flowing between the 10th and the 50th centile, and if you find that the CPR is abnormal, you deliver those babies by 38 weeks. That's the importance. You follow the protocol similar to the protocol that you would follow in late onset growth restriction. But that does not mean uh, direct cesarean or anything like that. Just follow the patient and deliver by around 38 weeks. To sum up, you should know your players and your teams. Early onset growth restriction, listen to the heart. Listen to the fetal heart. Late onset growth restriction, you have to listen to the brain. And that's what basically it means. Different things are used for different types of fetal growth restriction. Now, just a word about cardiac remodeling, because I promised I would talk about this. Just three slides on it. And what cardiac remodeling happens in cardiac remodeling is that in growth restriction, there's a change in both the shape and size of the heart. It becomes more globular and also there is going to be hypertrophy. And what are the things that you're going to look for is you're going to look for signs of diastolic failure. And an increase in your IRT is the first sign of diastolic failure because of which you're going to have a high tie index. The TAPC and MAPC are also going to decrease and you're going to have an increase in your E by A ratios as well. There is a thing called as the composite prenatal score which looks at the left ventricular sphericity index. It looks at TAPC, IRT and also CPR. And when you use a combination of all these factors, you have a 90% detection rate of those fetuses that would develop life would develop lifestyle diseases later on like hypertension and so on and by doing simple interventions in the first few years of life like promoting breastfeeding or giving omega-3 fatty acids it is possible to prevent these adult onset diseases see how good it is you can not only prevent perinatal outcomes but by looking at the heart as and looking at signs of cardiac remodeling you can actually bring about a change in the uh, in the outcomes of the fetus later on now how do we assess it and how do we look at cardiac function which parameter to use that is a whole new talk it's a completely different talk and as you all know good movies come in two parts like Bahubali, they come in two parts but really great ones come in part three and yes i would like to do a part three on growth restriction and cardiac outcomes and long-term outcomes but I don't want to do it as a webinar because when I do it as a webinar if I don't have the privilege of seeing you you have the privilege of seeing me but I don't have the privilege of seeing you and interacting with you because I would prefer that and therefore 
this part three would be after the covid time covid pandemic is over and maybe at a conference where i can actually talk and interact with you till then thank you thank you for listening i think i'll take questions now hold on yes okay i'm going to the qa section i'm sorry if you missed my uh, beginning of my talk i'm sorry I, i i don't know how much you missed uh i'll straight away go to the questions uh okay let's start off from the beginning one second i'm just getting okay so when we are talking about 32 week what does it mean gestational age or ultrasound age absolutely when you when you have a crl and when you're looking at it we're talking about the age as per the crl or the dating scan that's the, that's the age of the baby not the ultrasound estimated fetal weight or, or the uh, gestational age as per lmp it is if the patient has had a dating scan we're talking about uh the dating scan what about transient fluctuations of mca ranging widely without umbilical artery yes the mca can change especially towards term it happens basically when you're looking at uh, uh breathing movements within the fetus or if the baby has a hiccup or something like that you can have transient fluctuations but as long as there is no growth restriction and the umbilical artery is normal and the cpr is normal you don't have to worry about the mca are there some more vessels to do doppler in mid trimester for fgr now the only proven vessels are the vessels that i have talked about there are a lot of things under study that you can play the descending thoracic aorta and stuff like that but right now these are the players that we should be concentrating on what are the recommendations for a uh, number of fetal scans that could, should be done in one normal pregnancy and in case if there is fgr what should be the frequency of usg as you know too many tests are, okay, are not liked by the patient now ideally you would need a 12 week scan you would need a anomaly scan and in the third trimester i would suggest that you have two scans one uh, one at maybe around 32 and 33 weeks and maybe one closer to 36 and 37 weeks and both of them should be done with doppler the number of scans done in the entire 40 weeks i say i think i answered that what is the cut off gestational age for early and late onset fgr that is exactly what i am saying there is no cut off uh, gestational age the, the the general ballpark figure would be 32 weeks it is just enough to understand that it is a continuum or a spectrum so when you have a placental damage that is less than 30% usually your growth restriction is going to start by around 32 to 33 weeks and that is why that cut off is being used so you don't have to actually worry about the cut off or the gestational age what you have to worry about is to see if there is severe placental damage that you will know by looking at the umbilical artery and when the umbilical artery is abnormal you know you're dealing with a severe placental disease and in those cases there is a possibility of cardiovascular adaptations uh please do a webinar on settings of doppler okay that's okay how frequent should we be monitoring a patient with abnormal cpr but good umbilical diastolic flow again what is the context abnormal cpr in the context of late onset growth restriction or fgr you would do it on a weekly once basis but if you find that it is falling sharply if it is falling sharply you would increase your surveillance and you would add ctg and daily fetal movement count so that you do not no also look at the breathing movement in every scan that you do so that you do not miss out on a brain stem suppression Sir, please explain the mechanism of aortic isthmus abnormality. I did that already, but I'll just tell you once again. Just think of the aortic isthmus as a junction. Okay, in that junction, there are four important players. Two players they come in systole, and two players they come in diastole. In systole, you have on one side the left ventricle, and on the other side you have the right ventricle. the right ventricle tries to push the blood back into the aortic isthmus whereas the left ventricle tries to push it forward and that's what happens during systole in diastole when the semi lunar valves are open it is the peripheral resistance of the placenta on one side and the 
resistance in the middle cervical artery or the brachiocephalic vessels on the other side. So wherever there is more resistance, blood will flow into the opposite direction. So wherever there is less resistance. So if in FGR, what happens? Placental resistance is more. The resistance in the middle cervical artery is less. So the blood will flow into that direction. Now, because there are four players here, it is very difficult for us to say whether the abnormality is caused by one of them or all of them. And that is why it is still under research. Please let us be able to listen to both talks again. Okay, well, I'll think I'll tell them to do that. In gestational diabetes mellitus, sudden fetal death due to acute acidosis, the term can occur with normal Doppler. Will yes, will biophysical profile be useful in such a situation? Yes. In diabetes, there can't be a better tool than the biophysical profile because your umbilical artery, your heart, everything is fine. It is the brain stem that is suffering from hypoxia, and that is why CTG and biophysical profile are extremely useful in, in, in diabetes. Please explain about dietic systems, Doppler. And I've already done that. Uh, how frequently to repeat Doppler in early onset growth restriction? I think we already talked about that. It depends upon the stage of FGR. And depending upon the stage, you would uh, uh, repeat it. If things are, uh, thank you for the talk. If things are going to occur in steps, can we avoid NST? in early onset growth restriction, stage one and stage two. Uh, see, as I told you in the truffle trial, what did they do? They were doing CTG almost on a daily basis. So I think in stage one, maybe you could do it at a weekly one basis. But if you find that the disease is becoming more severe, like you have increasing resistance or a drop in the CPR, definitely you will have to increase your surveillance. In stage two, there is no doubt you would probably have to do CTG almost on a daily or every other day basis. Uh, can you say more about the CTG? Uh, and CTG is a whole different talk. It's a completely different talk. But it is just, just I think from an imaging perspective, what you need to know is that you should not just rely on Doppler. Even if your Doppler is normal, if you find that the Doppler is worsening, ask your obstetrician or clinician to do a CTG uh, very frequently because that is your safety net. How to manage a fetus with static weight over two to three weeks management should a static weight or deflecting weight is something a pro that's something of a problem, especially in late onset growth restriction. Even in those conditions, we will not deliver early, but we would wait till 38 weeks. We would wait for a CTG abnormality before we decide to trigger early delivery. Please explain more about CPR and its value to be used for timing of delivery. I told you CPR is only a guide because it is used in late onset growth restriction where it is, it is not of much use because what we're going to look at is how is it falling down. It is not for triggering delivery. It is for deciding if you want to use it for more surveillance. So yes, that is what it should be it should be done for. NGSO4 neuroprotection, yes, it should be used before 32 weeks, which is used in the same dose that you use for preeclampsia. In early onset fetal growth restriction, how frequently I already answered that. If only once can be done in the third trimester. See, there is... There is no question of only one scan being done. You need two scans to be done in the third trimester because one you would need at 32 or 33 weeks to pick up late onset anomalies, growth and all those growth and, and Doppler. And in one at close to 36 to 37 weeks because you want to actually pick up late onset growth restriction. Normal op scan without Doppler in the third trimester will be helpful or not. No, without Doppler, it's of no use because when you're looking at growth, as I told you, what if you're looking at an AGA baby and, and you also don't know what chart you're using. So if you're not using a standard chart, you may miss out on growth restriction completely. So I would suggest that whenever you're doing a growth scan, do a Doppler along with that. How to know the placental damage is 30% or more? Very simple. Look at the umbilical artery. If the umbilical artery is showing resistance, the placental damage is about 30%. Sir, is it not good if CTG and Doppler findings become favorable after steroid for lung maturity? On the other way, we can promote lung maturity too. See, steroids are used only for lung maturity and the, and the changes that you find in CTG and Doppler are transient findings. It is not actually that the baby is becoming better. They are transient findings and we should not rely on them. Definitely, you should give steroids for lung maturity, but not to improve your Doppler findings. Clinically, with experience, you should listen to the mother for fetal movements after 34 weeks. In late onset growth restriction, definitely the fetus, the mother's perception of fetal movements is very, very important. If she comes with two episodes 
of poor fetal moments, you have to put on increased surveillance. So is it not good if CTG and Doppler findings become favorable after I already answered that? Can you talk more on CTG? Maybe on some other talk, but mm, I think I've already covered that. <clears throat> Please see elaborate uh, fetal moment in IUGR. Yes, you, sh you should look at fetal mo breathing moment. Look at the diaphragm, look at the, uh, because you're looking at the brain stem. So when the brain stem is suppressed, you will not find a breathing moment. But that does not mean that if you don't find fetal moment, breathing moment, you're going to jump and decide on early delivery. You do a CTG, you call the patient back and reassess the patient again. And that's when you will find that uh, uh, it, it, is, it, is, it is normal. And then you, would, you can decide on whether you want to wait or not. For which week of gestation can we do CTG? From 30 weeks onwards, you can do it. But we would also suggest that if you're looking for late decelerations, you could do it from anywhere around 28 to 29 weeks. The reason, again, here is the brainstem maturity, because which becomes mature after 30 weeks. Uh, OK, thank you, Saurabh, for that comment. I'm not reading it out. Uh, could you please highlight a little on ductus venosus flow again? Yes, the ductus venosus, as I told you, it is a special vessel because it does not enter into the right atrium as we normally think. As it enters into the heart, it falls through the foramen away and goes directly into the left atrium and supplies and protects the left atrium and the heart and the entire brain. But it is the right ventricle that fails in FGR. And because of that, you're going to have DV reversal in the ductus venosus or increased backward pressure. And that backward pressure is what causes the DV to uh, to cause uh, co cause an abnormality, and finally, the you have you have to take the baby out for acidosis. How do we follow up cases of high resistance flow in the umbilical artery at 32 weeks? That would be a stage one IUGR where you have high resistance in the umbilical artery, and you would follow them up exactly as you would do in stage one uh, IUGR. Thank you, uh, Shilpa, for that comment. Fetal ECG, uh, no, no comments on fetal ECG. We're, we're, we're too early for that. Fetal moment count criteria, how many per hour? That's what I said. There is no specific fetal moment count because every baby moves on its own. Only the mother will know the baby's pattern and the mother will be the first person to warn you. There are a number of formulas that they use like 10 movements in a day, one moment uh, or total number of movements of less than 10 for two days and things like that. But all those things don't help. The mother's perception is what's very important. The mother will tell you, my baby was moving very well till a few days back, but right now it's not moving so good. And that's that's your that's your point. And if that comes two times, if she says it two times, even after you're reassuring her, looking at the doctor, everything is fine, CTG is fine. And if she tells that again, and if it is in a setting of late onset growth restriction, then you have to be careful. Uh, and 36 weeks, four days, SGA, normal Doppler, NST at 37 weeks. Uh, 36 weeks, four days, SGA, normal Doppler, NST is normal at 37 weeks, four days. To repeat Doppler at 38 weeks plus, aim pushing to deliver till 40 weeks to deliver. SGA fetuses, if, you, if, you, if I'm understanding correctly, you're talking about a baby that is constitutionally small, not FGR. In those babies, you would follow them up on a twice weekly basis. That means once in two weeks, and you would deliver them at 40 weeks. You don't have to do constant monitoring, provided you're sure that you're dealing with an SGA baby. Uh, Bhupati sir has asked a question, why is CCTG not available? I, I think, sir, it's mainly because of the cost factor. We are we have not bought it because of the cost factor, but uh, definitely it is. Uh, I mean, if you, if, it, if you can invest in it, it is definitely worthwhile because then it takes away this problem of inter and intra observer variability. Can you please explain stage three FGR, early FGR again? Stage three FGR is when you have signs of acidosis. So what happens here is that you will have either a severe abnormality in the umbilical artery, which would be a reversal or you would have a DVPI that is greater than the 95th centile. So these two markers are markers of acidosis. So stage three is the beginning of acidosis, and that's what uh, is stage three is all about. Which uh, steroid preparation is offered and why? Dexa or bethazone. Both are OK. You can use both Dexa or bethazone. But if you don't want to get confused with the uh, dexamethasone uh, with the beta methasone causing a problem with the changes that I talked about, it would be safer to give dexa. But as far as lung maturity is concerned, both are fine. 
which is the serum marker uh, to detect FGR in the first trimester and second trimester. In first trimester, you have PAPI, which is uh, pretty useful. PLGF is also used. And second trimester, you have a number of markers like SFLIT. Uh, but again, those are all under study. So how to detect IUGR and monochorionic twins? That's a different uh, talk. CTG, again, it's difficult to talk right now. Uterine artery, umbilical artery, PI ratio. Yes, uh, but still under study, I would not be recommending it right now. When should monitoring of late onset IUGR? Monitoring begins whenever you make the diagnosis. When you make a diagnosis of late onset IUGR, you definitely start monitoring. Sir, please describe pathophysiology of effect of brain saturation on brain stem and cascade of events. Okay, pathophysiology of the effect of brain saturation. We just understand this much. The brain stem has got centers that I've talked about. Respiration, cardiac variability, movement, and tone. And when you have hypoxia, each of these centers are going to be suppressed. The most sensitive centers are going to be your center for cardiac variability and your center for breathing. So when you have hypoxia, these two centers are going to go first. And that's why I said no need to look at the whole biophysical profile. Just look at the breathing moment and do a CTG. And that's when you would be able to uh, pick up these abnormalities. Uh, Good talk explains why we lose a lot of babies in the third trimester. Thank you, Dr. Anjali. Uh, Karthik, uh, can you please explain uh, management? I, I already Management of stage 3 FGR is because you have acidosis now, you would wait for DV reversal if it is less than 30 weeks. And between 30 and 32 weeks, you would wait for umbilical artery reversal. Sir, in your practice, what is your protocol regarding the FMC? When a mother comes to me and tells me that she has a reduced fetal moment, I do give her a fetal kick chart. And I tell her to monitor her fetal kicks after each meal and to see if there is an abnormality in that. But I also tell her to go by her gut feeling. And if she feels that there is a reduced fetal moment, to come immediately for follow-up. And also, if there is a decreased fetal moment, I would put her on increased surveillance. At what at age of gestation do we start taking umbilical artery? Whenever you have growth restriction, you should look at the umbilical artery Doppler. How to diagnose FGR and EGA babies? I'm sorry, that is part one. Uh, that will come up, come I think soon as a link. Fetal movement count. I've already answered that. Please repeat again. Management recording to you. It's it's already there in the talk. I'm sure you, they will be giving a link of the same. Role of aspirin and the dose in preventing prevention of cases showing high risk IUGR. See, there is uh, no clear cut answer for aspirin right now. Yes, it is used in preeclampsia. 150 is definitely useful. But in uh, growth restriction, this, the jury is still out. But I think aspirin, if it works for one preeclampsia, it should work for growth restriction if you are looking at severe placental disease. But right now, the jury is still out. If we need to deliver following tr trigger, you explain how much time do we need to wait for the steroids to work? Yeah, it depends on the severity of IUGR that you're looking at. So if you're looking at a very severe form of IUGR, you give steroids, increase your surveillance. For example, if you're looking at DVPA that is high, you would almost do your surveillance after every six hours or three, or on an hourly basis, or even after 12 hours, and you will give enough time for the steroids to act, and you will wait for the whole course to go through. Tell us about the role of a amniotic fluid in uh, volume in early and late onset growth restriction. As I told you, amniotic fluid tells you that there is a problem. Yes, there is decreased renal perfusion. But when it comes to management, we can't use it because it does not tell us the severity of the disease. It tells you that there is uh, poor renal output, but it does not tell you if the brain stem is acidotic, if the, there is cardiovascular adaptation. It does not give you information on that. And that is why it cannot be used on management. It definitely tells you that there is chronic hypoxia, but not on management. In early onset IUGR, is AFI not important at all? If Doppler is normal, can we wait? Uh, if, yes, you can wait till the AFI is 2 or 3 Doppler. Again, I'm repeating this once more. AFI is not a trigger for delivery. It is only Doppler and CTG and all the things that I talked about. Any significance of normal CPR due to increased MCA diastolic flow in normally growing a baby above the 50th centile. Uh, again, if your baby is above the 50th centile, we are looking at an area that is still unexplored. We do not know why there is an abnormal CPR in these conditions. So it's still uh, out on debate. But if you have an abnormal CPR, 
and you have increased MCA diastolic flow, it would be better to put that baby on surveillance. That's all I can say. Because some of these babies may be diabetic. And if there is diabetes, there could be hypoxia that could be completely missed. So yes, if you find an abnormality, always put that baby on surveillance. How do we follow up high resistance flow in the umbilical artery at 32 weeks? High resistance flow in the umbilical artery would be stage one. So you would follow them up on a weekly once basis, even, yeah, even on a weekly once basis. Is it justified to deliver at 30 weeks with only uterine artery abnormalities, but not severe pH? Absolutely not. Uterine art, if you saw in my entire talk, I have not talked about uterine artery because uterine artery is not used for management. It is only for diagnosis. Why DEXA is better than beta? I already told that. Perhaps any specific precaution for FGR in diabetic mother will rule change. Uh, in, we have still do not know how to actually manage FGR in diabetic mothers. Uh, it is still out on debate, but yes, uh, CTG and biophysical profile is very, very useful. The role of uterine artery Doppler in late onset IUGR. In other words, when you resort to uterine artery Doppler, when do you resort? Whenever you find that the baby is small, you would look at the uterine artery to make the diagnosis of fetal growth restriction. Once you have made the diagnosis of fetal growth restriction, you are not going to use uterine artery Doppler to decide your management. Because after that, it does not give you any information about the condition of the baby. The condition of the baby directly relies on the things that I just talked about. What is done if the fetus is crossed 34 weeks and the Doppler is abnormal? Cross 34 weeks, again, it's the same thing I told you. It depends on what abnormality you're talking about. Any cutoff uh, form or formula to know how much percentage. I just look at the umbilical artery. Please show that chart showing what all to be checked uh, in late on. So this talk will be available again, so you can see it there. If low CPR is noted in early FGR around 27 weeks and diastolic flow is present in umbilical artery, how then how do you? Again, I said in early FGR, cerebral Dopplers are of no use. In early FGR, you're going to rely only on cardiovascular adaptation, and therefore CPR on MC has got no role in early onset growth restriction. Many times I come across MCA Doppler variation. What was found is MCA redistribution by one operator is seen as normal in another next visit. How do you see? That is what I said. MCA Doppler is a hemodynamic event. I said this last time as well. So there are a number of factors that will affect the pressure within the brain. So one finding is not enough. You have to repeat your observations and look at the general trend before you decide whether you're looking at, at, at an abnormality or not. Can you elaborate the RV normally causes retrograde flow? Didn't understand that. See, the RV pushes the blood through the aortic isthmus in the opposite direction, whereas the LV pushes the blood in the forward direction. That is why you get the specific waveform that you got in the aortic isthmus with a sharp peak and a downward trend. And because the RV is more dominant towards the third trimester, it would push blood a little bit more. And that is where you would get an end systolic reversal, which is normal in the aortic isthmus. So no role for uterine artery Doppler in late IUGR and AG fetuses. The role is only for diagnosis, not for management. In case of FGR with normal Doppler and CTG at 36 weeks, how long to wait? Uh, I said delivery in case of twins, and that's another session altogether. Uh, GDM with FGR, any change in protocols? Again, I said, if it is FGR, you follow the same protocols that you follow. But if it is GDM with an EGA baby, that is when we need to change the protocols or think about looking at other things. If you get effective fetal, estimated fetal weight at say 30th centile at 32 weeks, how will you follow up every two weeks? Look at growth velocity Doppler. I, if you if you were there for my first talk, I would have told you this, and you would have heard this that uh, if you find that the estimated weight is at the 30th centile, it again depends upon whether you're looking at an EGA baby that is growth restricted or not, and therefore you have to look at growth velocity and also your CPR. And if it is abnormal, you would follow the same principles of late onset growth restriction. Do you recommend a USG after 32 weeks? Uh, normal growing baby, how often? Because there is sudden death, even a normal. Again, 32 weeks normal growing baby means what? Was it less than the 50th centile? As I told you, find out growth restriction in the normal growing baby as well, along with growth and Doppler, and then do your follow up accordingly. Are there fetuses who may be constitutionally meant to be small at term and may be mistaken for AGA and late growth restriction lead to unnecessary intervention? Uh, 
yes there is a possibility if you do that but again you have to understand that if you follow the principles that i talked about right now in the last two talks is unlikely uh, for that to happen uh okay at what is i have already answered that how much time do we it usually comes out the breathing movement is usually seen within the first minute but by the time you finish your scan which would be normally around 10 minutes by you do a growth and doppler scan you should be seeing your breathing movement and if you don't see it just send the patient for a ctg complex artery is normal mca is abnormal what to do look at the cpr if complex artery is normal mcr look at the cpr look at if there is growth restriction because if the mca is abnormal complex artery is normal the cpr is going to be definitely abnormal uh any reference for cpr chart centile chart yes you can use the barcelona or the perinatology.com charts that are available can explain stage 3 and 4 management with respect to steroid and trigger for delivery i've already covered that in the talk i think you can you will be able to see that in the link how does ctg help in early fgr since parasympathetic mature late how would one enter yes you're right about that in early fgr we are only looking for late decelerations we're not looking for variability and that's why it i said it is a late abnormality in early fgr we are solely referring to doppler because we know that the heart is susceptible but we are using the ctg as a safety net and the importance here is that you cannot do daily uh, dopplers but you can do daily ctg and by doing a daily ctg by looking at the ctg especially in severe early onset growth restriction you can check for late onset diesel late decelerations and provoke late decelerations if we get estimated fetal weight at say 30th center i think i already answered that uh is there uh, any use of to sample mca before 30 or 32 weeks uh it is important to look at it but you will not decide your management based on that uh, i think there are a lot of questions here i have a patient uh, it's too long the question is up, but i'm sorry skip it doppler to be done at what gestation if there is previous history of pih again doppler is done only if you are suspecting growth restriction or you are doing a growth scan in your third trimester and you want to see if the baby is normal or not uh in early onset iugr if doppler is normal can we wait till if i is 2 or 3 also yes you can uh you sudden fetal death sudden fetal death in macrosomic baby with cp with still cpr be useful it, we do not know whether cpr will be useful in macrosomic babies with diabetes macrosomy is still a disease in search of a protocol so it's, it's still difficult to answer that question Uh, in late onset iugr we still use twice a week afi and deliver if the afi reduces to below 5 no afi is not used for management in eg with fgr and cpr less than 5 cm and ctg normal when to deliver eg with fgr cpr is low ctg is normal i already answered this 38 weeks on the only trigger for early delivery in eg if it is at your late onset is an abnormal ctg what can what about one scan at 28 weeks and then at 20, 36 weeks instead of 32 33 and then 36 weeks it depends on on whether you want to do it we normally do a scan for the anomaly scan and then we do one at 28 we do it 32 and 36 as well but it depends on what your referring obstetrician uh, feels is best but i think yes you should do 32 33 and 36 weeks recently i found a case of increased umbilical artery a pi with absence of e wave in the uh, what is the uh, absence of e wave in the av valve i think you have to i don't i cannot say that because you take i see that case why would the e wave be absent the e wave has to always be present because you that is passive flow from the atria to the ventricle recently i found a case of increase i'm um, yeah, so that is there any significance of diastolic reversal in routine scan at 32 weeks Uh, yes if you find that there is diastolic reversal it happens sometimes when you have a normal growing baby and you look at the doppler and you find reversal in those cases we do follow the protocol of early delivery because uh, that that is something that is varying but it happens very very rarely if doppler is a normal for stage 1 i use fgr does it indicate that intact brain stem no for the brain stem you have to look at the ctg and the biophysical profile uh, profile breathing movement what can be the cause of sudden death okay we okay, answered all that how do we say it will be normal or you don't have to say whether it is normal or abnormal just look at the fetal breathing breathing movement and that should be enough is is normal cpr more than one or abnormal less than one no it's based on the centile less than the fifth centile for the for the gestational age means abnormal cpr
what conditions are there are a lot of questions here i don't think i'll be able to take all of them uh okay let me see uh, what are the normal doppler indices of umbilical artery doppler i think it's already covered in the talk where you look at uh, pi is what we look at can you explain the pathophysiology why there is high d high pi in the dv before reversal uh, the resistance increases as the heart begins to fail the pi of the heart of the dv increases before it reverses that means the a wave becomes progressively smaller because it, it, it before it re reverses and that is why you have a high dv pi uh, why do patients complain of decreased fetal movement after there is no uh, proper understanding of why steroids causes decreased fetal movements but it does and the and the effect lasts for sometimes up to 7 days after a steroid administration but it is not harmful to the fetus and that has to be kept in mind does routine uterine not have any role in addition to the above parameters no uterine artery is only for diagnosis what is cardiovascular adaptation i think i covered that in the talk you will have to listen to that while checking for is the time duration of breathing that indicates fetal well being yes it should be lasting for at least 30 seconds uh so what means standard charts oh i already did that in the first part well okay can mca pi increase after previous fall due to failure of the auto regulate okay now this is something i want to it's a good question what about the mca becoming normalization of the mca uh, uh, after you have increases in this because of cerebral edema or the brain sinking effect now if you see that the mca pi is becoming normal because of the because of the uh, failure of the auto regulatory mechanism that is because you have failed to look at the heart because if you look at the heart first that is what will fail first before the brain fails and therefore the brain sinking effect is something that you should not wait for it is like looking for umbilical venous pulsations before deciding to deliver when you decide to look when you see an mcapi that has become normal in a setting of severe dv reversal it means you have already become late in deciding to deliver should we include the management uh, at the end of the report of doppler i am a radiologist uh, yes i don't think there is anything wrong in suggesting management i think when a patient comes to you for a scan you don't have to just report you can also suggest uh, your management as well you're well within your rights to do so so what is the significance of mca doppler reverse in other ways normal mca doppler can reverse at times when you have increased resist increased pressure within the brain and that happens in hiccups or breathing movements or sudden jerky movements that's uh, abs absolutely fine and so you don't have to worry about it if the growth and everything else is is normal i think that comes to an exhaustive uh, end of the questions uh, session uh, i if there are any if there are no more questions thank you so much uh, it's been a pleasure to be here but as i said before a part 3 i would like to do it in person rather than being here so that i have the privilege of seeing you thank you thank you so much